Hello! Welcome to this week's episode of Why Not Both, brought to you by Under the Radar Magazine. Why Not Both is an exploration of how our multiple passions inform our identity. You can subscribe to us on your favorite podcast platform and also join us on social media. We're under WNB, the podcast, and we are on Instagram as well as Twitter. If you haven't heard any of our episodes before, I'll introduce myself. My name is Pam Schaefer, and I'm a musician and therapist in Los Angeles. This week, we got to interview Kid Moxie, and she is not only a talented musician, but is also an incredible actress. This week, her first debut soundtrack got onto the front page of iTunes, so I'm so proud of her, and I'm really excited to share the conversation that we had. I hope you enjoy. Welcome to Why Not Both. I'm here with Elena, aka Kid Moxie, and... I would love to ask you my first question, which is, what do you do? And what's a better question to ask? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, hi. So great to be here with you. Um, I do music uh, because I love it. I've been doing it since I was a kid. And then I act, which I was also doing mostly as a kid, but also as an adult as well. Oh, wow. Because so that's my dual identity. How did you start acting as a kid? I grew up in Greece, mm -hmm. and uh, at age three, I started doing piano, and then I expressed an interest in starting to take, you know, my parents took me to the theater all the time, so I started taking, oh. like, kids' drama uh, uh -huh. classes, Aww. and then somehow I found my way on television, presenting a kid's show, and then being in theater back in Greece. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's kind of how it started. I love that you just, like, found yourself presenting a kid's show. <laughs> I did an that's audition in my, in my school. <laughs> I was, like, second grade. Oh, that's precious. Yeah, so that's kind of how the whole showbiz thing card started. That's so funny. Flipping for me. <laughs> and you started, you said you were taking piano at three. Yeah, which is not very weird for uh, a Greek girl. You kind of start by piano, mm -hmm. French. And ballet, that's kind of like, they give you your, they shove your identity pretty fast. They're like, here you are. No choice. That's how, that's what good girls do. Wow. I, I actually had to, I wanted to take piano lessons when I was three, but I had to wait until I could reach a fifth on the piano. Oh, wow. Because my hands were so small. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look at us. We both have cute stories about how we started playing piano. Exactly. And, yeah. <laughs> That's so interesting. And so if you immediately started in piano, French and ballet, it sounds like you actually did really like, actually enjoy the music though. I did up to a certain point because piano was very strict mm. and there's so many rules with classical music. So I started feeling about eight, nine years down the line. So what, 12, 13, mm -hmm. I started feeling super constricted mm -hmm. by classical music, mm -hmm. by the classical structure of both piano and the ballet. Gotcha. So guess what I did? I, my brother was a drummer. I was like, that's what I want to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> that's more for me. So I quit playing the piano mm -hmm. and developed like a really strong aversion towards piano for a wow. while. Yeah, just because I felt so much pressure from it. Well, and also, I don't know if you had this experience, but growing up, I didn't see a lot of non-classical female pianists. Like, it wasn't until I encountered Tori Amos. That, right. Yeah, a friend, of, yeah. a friend of mine brought a CD of hers to school to cheer me up one day. And that was, like, life-changing for me because I hadn't seen other female pianists because I turned away from the piano in the same way where it's like I turned away from classical structure um, but was not, in fact, good at other instruments. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to be, by the way. You don't have to be good on an instrument. I keep saying this to people, like, free yourself from the virtuoso, you know, pressure. No need to be virtuoso in any instrument. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. I, I was curious what you picked up because I attempted to pick up guitar and found that, like, I was really great at playing uh, E minor chord. And that was really my repertoire. You know, guitar felt really delicate for me. I wanted something that had an aggression element to it. Mm. So drums was the first to go to thing because mm -hmm. my brother was started teaching had, me drums. That's cool. And then right out of high school, when I moved to the States, I was like, my instrument of choice now is going to be the bass. Wow. Because it kind of combines having the melodic element and right. the rhythmic element. Right. It felt like the spine um, in a band. And I wanted to be yeah. in a rock band. So I was in a like a goth 
Japanese yes. goth band in San Francisco in my teens. And so bass was basically the instrument that I still play when I do live shows and I still love. Ooh. And it's just kind of like a mysterious, still has a mystery element. It's the thing you hear the most when you're away from the music, mm -hmm. the source of the music. Because you can feel it, like you feel you it in like your it. solar plexus. Exactly. And it's what you hear the less in a way when you're close. That's huh. not what you pay attention to, the bass. But when you're far, it's the bass that hits you. I hadn't thought of it that way. And that's a fascinating way to think of it. And I love that you described it as the spine. Yeah, that's kind of how it always felt to me. So I wanted to, I wanted control. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of OCD. I, I'm not kind of, I'm OCD. I'm pretty controlling <laughs> with what I put out in general as far as what I create. So mm -hmm. bass felt, wow, you're holding this really big instrument, which yeah. as a girl, it felt that's powerful. really powerful. And uh, it also felt like you are bridging rhythm and melody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you're the spine. You're keeping everything together. Yeah, exactly. Ah, oh, that's so juicy. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, that's why I did it. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So when you're, when you're Kid Moxie, so you're playing bass live, what else are you doing, like, the programming around the music? Like, so what's I your... write the music, yeah. basically. And I have two more musicians that play it live with me because I'm not an octopus, I guess. Right. <laughs> You're not? So, no. Well, <laughs> contrary to what you might yeah. think. Shock, shocking yeah. new information. Not an octopus. Not an octopus. That's one thing I'm not. I am a lot of things in general. <laughs> not that. Can cross that one off the list. <laughs> so I play a uh, drum pad mm -hmm. on certain tracks. I play the bass on most tracks and mm. I sing. Awesome. I think that is, uh, uh, being on stage, I've been trying to do the same thing where I'm like triggering a sample pad, playing keyboards and singing. And after a while you're like, I don't know about for you, but for me, it takes away from the performative element because I'm so focused on the technical element. Exactly. That then I'm like, this is probably boring to watch. If I'm like too fiddly. Right. And keyboards and programming keeps you kind of, um, what's the word? It, it keep you on, you, don't, you cannot move around much. Exactly. In other words. Exactly. You with can, the bass, yeah. I felt I can move around with it. Yeah. And it actually gives me something to do with my hands yeah. that might, maybe looks cool in pictures or on video too. So... Have you ever yeah. had the experience when singing without an instrument that you're like, ha what do I do with arms? Yeah, it feels weird because <laughs> yeah. I don't identify as a singer. There's people that sing way better than I do. You know, that's not, I sing and I think how I sing matches the music I create, mm -hmm. but I am not Celine Dion. I will never be on The Voice. <laughs> it's not my forte. I don't have that operatic voice. Right. But I do believe I know how to create an atmosphere with my voice mm -hmm. so that's kind of my mm -hmm. strength it's not to be have a bunch of octaves available right you're not just going to go on a Mariah Carey I spree am not. I shall not <laughs> will not <laughs> so now we've got not an octopus not Mariah, not Carey. Mariah Carey yeah <laughs> <laughs> needed to kind of put that on the record you know at some point in my life <laughs> your secret's out <laughs> yeah <laughs> how how long have you been Kid Moxie so it's probably about 10 years, which is awesome. when I moved to L.A. Mm -hmm. I was an actress. I had just got out of drama school in San Francisco, which was my first stop in the U.S. And I was working somewhat, but as most actors in L.A., there's really big breaks from working. Yes. Mostly breaks from working rather than yes. actually working. And again, my controlling nature uh, in a good way, kind of kicked in and said, while you're waiting for people to approve you to work. Yes. Which is kind of what being an actor is in this town. Well, yeah. And I think people, I think explaining to people listening to the podcast would be useful, like, so that they know, like, what that process is. Because being, being here, like, the cycle of, like, auditions and then work, it's almost like when you're working, it's this incredible peak. Yes. And then... And then there's mass, there's a really big downtime yeah what do you do with yourself how do you what do you do with yourself during this downtime how do you stay creative yeah and still manage to kind of have your fingerprint out in the out in the world which was important to me yeah. at least that I don't just I'm not just here waiting for a phone to ring well yeah because you know? otherwise you're in this like weird it's almost like a weird purgatory where it's like if you're not if you're not actively working and producing something what are you doing? You're sitting around waiting for someone, but no one wants to just spend most of their time waiting. No. That's weird. I know I did not. And I had just left my band, in the golf band mm -hmm. in San Francisco, and I'm like, maybe I should just start really writing my own stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and that's how I started Kid Moxie. 
with my roommate in Silver Lake. She Amazing. was a violinist in the Pasadena Orchestra, and mm -hmm. she and I were in our living room and just starting That's to awesome. play music there, you know. And literally, we had a garage space in our building that mm -hmm. we were practicing. And this seems like this story could have taken place in 1963, but... <laughs> A producer walked by, <laughs> a producer. heard us pl play, <laughs> of course. and they said, hey girls, I like what you're doing. Do you want to like record it? And he lived right next door. We put our first demo down. Oh my God. And this was not 1963, you know, That's that much was better years than, ago. I was going to say that was in like, because right around when like Silver Lake and Echo Park almost kind of like changed right around the same time. When they were still affordable for musicians and prior to that when they were affordable for families. And it's like they've gone through this really rapid cycle of change that 10 years ago, that makes total sense. Yes. Like that was the time. Yeah. That, that was exactly the time that a producer like because I'm like, oh, yeah, my friends used to have studios there and now it's too expensive for the most part. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that would have been the perfect time. I was just like, yeah, I can totally picture that. <laughs> yeah. like just yeah. like getting coffee at like cafecito and then walking by someone's garage and being like oh that's great music yeah exactly <laughs> like, no social media no it was no youtube sort of thing happening i wasn't yeah. was there even spot there was no spotify i don't think there was spotify then because that was it was analog contact between people like somebody actually physically was there yeah and, and that, said yes. hey <laughs> that's kind of how kid moxie started too yes um And then I quickly realized that it's better for me to kind of take it all upon myself because I wasn't good at collaborating day mm. in and out with somebody else. Oh, wow. And so I kind of started, you know, with my friend. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to continue this on my own mm -hmm. and then just have people play for live shows with me. Got it. Because I wanted to fully control the sound. I pulled a complete Billy Corgan. I was going to say you and... pulled a John Bryan and I'm here for yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So you know exactly what I'm talking yep, about. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so what was that like kind of realizing that you were going to take the reins of the project? Um, I have to say it was for me it was kind of liberating that I didn't feel like I had to bounce my ideas. I know that sounds very sort of maybe egotistical and maybe it is, but it felt safer mm -hmm. that I didn't have to always join forces mm -hmm. that At any time of the day, I could do something and make executive decisions that this is how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And so it felt empowering. Right. And it felt safe, uh, but in a good way. At the same time, it felt like, okay, it's all on me now. If something sucks and stuff has sucked, Yeah, it's then all you're on like, me. oh, it's all on me. Yeah. Well, in a way, that's very, it's liberating and empowering. And it also makes you, I would imagine it would make you a lot more resourceful if you're the one doing everything on your own. I guess, yeah. And I'm not, again, I'm not... I don't think I'm amazing at any of the elements. I'm not an amazing keyboard player. I'm not an amazing bass player. I'm not an amazing singer. But the goal for me was never to be a virtuoso in any of these things, was to kind of build something with what I knew and build those elements together in a way that mm -hmm. it sounded... Altogether, the result was part of a world sonically that I wanted yes. to inhabit. Yes. And so that was the goal. I was like, I want to create an atmosphere, a scene, feel something... And I really don't have to be excellent at doing that. And that was another liberating element. Feeling I was going to be say, excellent. I love that lesson of like, you don't have to be a virtuoso. You don't. Like, Especially like, now. Like yeah. with what's available to us as resources, whether that's, you know, hardware, software, yeah. you don't have to be. And I also like the idea that you said that it's kind of like you let yourself not be good at stuff. Like, you're like, yeah. sometimes it sucked. Sometimes it was great. <laughs> like, But you know, at the end, what I realize in the end is if the vocals are not recorded perfectly, mm -hmm. it's actually might be even better because people respond to music in a guttural way. Yes. They don't judge how auto-tuned. Well, I mean, they don't judge how perfect a voice right. is when it's auto-tuned. Right. But because the emotion is going to creep in through the cracks. Right. You know, like through the imperfections. Mm -hmm. The same way you fall mm -hmm. in love with somebody. Yeah. I think it's not because they're perfect any given moment of the day. No. It's because when you see those imperfections, you relate. Yeah. That's how you fall in love. So that's kind of how I think about it. It's okay to not be polished, perfect. Yes. You know. Because, and I think in some ways, perfection is off putting. I think so. <laughs> like... In my book, it is. <laughs> you know. Um, I was talking to a friend who has a new love interest, and we were talking yesterday about when you first fall in love, how. 
the it's the little things about people that are so revelatory. Like you're like you were walking down the street. Your feet take you places. My feet take me places. <laughs> it's actually, I think it's, you kind of sum it up. It's like when the mundane becomes important. Mm -hmm. That's when you know that you're falling in love. Uh -huh. You know, whether it's a person, whether it's a movie, you know, since we're kind of equating art to falling in love, it's mundane things, small things, how a light shines on somebody yeah. that will capture you exactly. or how they will look when they are not speaking. You know, like all those small things, we make them bigger. Yes. Than they are. Yeah. And I, I love that you allow your audience to, to yeah. create an atmosphere and to create a scene and be like, this isn't perfect. This is here for you. Let's communicate. Yeah. I do think it's important to relate or else what is really the point for in my book, if, if, I, if somebody cannot relate to what I am making, right. then what's the point of You're like, why would I make it? Putting it out there. Just keep it to myself then. Exactly. You know? And there are some songs, I don't know about you, there's some songs that I've written that like, I don't really feel the need to share because it just was to get it out. Yeah, it's a but, diary. Yeah. It's a diary. Yeah, and it's like then there are others that like I feel really compelled that I'm like, oh, this one I really want to like arrange and produce and get out to people and like. Right. Yeah. Right. Some it's things you want to share. Yeah. yeah. Some things you want to keep to yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. Do you find that that's, I was like, I was thinking in the back of my mind, like, does that affect like which roles you choose to take in acting? Well, I mean, in all honesty, it's not like you have all these things available to you in acting and you're like, oh, I'm going to do this, yeah. I'm not going to do this. So if we're being pragmatic, yes, of course, you have to let go of some things. Stereotypes are usually things I'm not interested in, I have that I have been actually offered, and I'm not interested mm -hmm. in playing. But other than that, for example, yeah. in a thriller, I've done a few thrillers in my past. Uh -huh. Most of them are not good. And... <laughs> But the victory was I did not have sex and then die. Hey. You know, woo <laughs> I like that as like a, a female actor, you're like, thank God. Yeah. I'm like, that's the threshold. It's like the bar is on the ground. Yeah, it's already and on the ground. And you're like, oh, wow, we skipped over the bar. Yeah. I didn't <laughs> die. I didn't have sex. I was driving a truck. I was smoking a spliff. I was like, so that was kind of cool being okay. in a thriller in that context. Good. Because if I was having sex in a pool and then I just got stabbed of because, because I got to get it yeah. because I had sex because that's really what's underneath that. Of course. I'm not I hate into that, that trope. I'm like, Ugh. I'm so, sure that you probably get pitched things like that and you're just like, oh, great. It's that again. I do. There is a stereotype and I used to get it much more when I was first starting out. But um, yeah, those are things that I am not proud of seeing myself this way. Yeah. So why would I do it? I want to be proud of myself. Exactly. At the end of the day. So that would make me proud. I was like, I'm going to be here for you for that. Because yeah. I was just like, <laughs> I can't imagine like reading like script number 1000 is brushing her teeth in her underwear. Yes. I mean, and why? <laughs> Again, like When why? the murder approaches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, you're like, great, cool. I'm basically an underwear model that gets killed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so what's the point of that? Am I right. going to really, it's gonna, is that going to feed me in a way that I need? Right. No. No. How did you transition from, like, when you said you moved to the States, like, I guess kind of two questions. Like, how did you transition into acting as an adult from being a child? And also, what motivated you to move to the States and specifically San Francisco? So I always wanted to be in the U.S. I definitely had an American dream plaguing me. Forever. <laughs> I felt during a trip to New York with my family when I was around 15 mm -hmm. and I saw the smoke coming out from the subway. Oh, that looked like the most magical thing I had ever seen in my life. Oh my gosh. I love that. Like the first time I went to New York, I was like, ah, and you're like, Ooh, magic. No, I thought it was the most magical place. Oh my gosh. And I know I sound like a total immigrant, but I am a total immigrant. I still believe in the American dream. I still believe I've done things here experience things here that I would have never experienced anywhere else, not just in Greece, but anywhere right. else. And even if it's just an illusion that uh, you can make your dreams come true here, I prefer to live by that illusion than the harsh reality of like, get a job, just, you know, have a kid, yeah. which is kind of the norm in places that are more uh, sort of religious, patriarchal, mm -hmm. which is Southern Europe, which is where mm -hmm. I come from. I was going to say, because you grew up in Greece. Where did you grow up in Greece? Athens. Oh, gotcha. I mean, it's a pretty liberal place now compared to what it used to be. Mm -hmm. But for me, it felt there's so much more out there. And as yeah. I was in high school, I was like, I cannot wait 
to get myself over <laughs> over there. I wanted to be in New York, but then I actually fell in love with somebody that lived in San Francisco, and I was like, mm-hmm. "Oh, that will do." Yeah, you're like, I'm, I'm still. I love doing that you're it. like that's close enough. <laughs> yeah, like I don't care. <laughs> California looks amazing, and I'm so glad I actually ventured that's into California. So funny. Well, and I feel like California is in alignment with what you said about kind of, you know, it's better to live by a dream, whether that dream is real or not, than to not have a dream at all. Exactly. And especially California. And I would say, I mean, I may be biased because I'm from here, but like Los Angeles in particular is a city where you're like, I would like to do something extraordinarily outlandish. And everyone's like, oh, okay, cool. Yes. Like they're just like, they're like, all right. Thank like, you for saying that, because you're actually from here, because I sound like the stupid immigrant, which I am, again, and I don't mind being that kind of like, you know, I have all these dreams in my yeah, head. I yeah. did coming here so young, and I still do, um, but you being from here and recognizing that too really kind of makes the point even stronger. Yeah, it's you know? like people, it's definitely not, I wouldn't say it's easy to necessarily execute your dreams, but people will not... Uh, People will not like pop your bubble. Like exactly. They're, they're just like, okay, yeah, of course you could do that. Like, I mean, I think about the things that you're doing and the things that all of my friends are doing and the people I've interviewed are doing. And it's like, it's not considered unusual. And people will be like, if you have that dream, like, go for it. Exactly. And that's how I want to live my life. That's the kind of environment I want around me as far as a mentality. Because mm-hmm. it that's very nurturing. Yeah. The other thing is not. Yeah. And I think about... <laughs> I mean, I was only very, very briefly in Athens, and I loved it because I studied classics. And so for me, it was nerd fiesta the whole time I was there, (laughs) (laughs) having a meltdown. Um, But one thing that struck me about the city is that it is so rooted in history. Like everything in the city is based around the history of the city, which is so rich. But also that's it's looking back instead of looking forward. It's true. And exactly, again, to my point, we used to be the empire uh, 2,500 years ago. Right. So in the same way, the U.S. is the empire now. Yeah. And weirdly enough now, like, it's like we're, uh, I I would say probably this might be kind of the dissipation of the empire. Yes. I mean, (laughs) this might be. (laughs) I'm taking the whole administration out of this. Yeah. I was just like, I I, I was like, yeah, this is, this is a dodgy time for the empire. This could be the, the fall of the empire, but it's still within that realm. But it's within the, yeah. And when you moved here, it was definitely, I mean, I feel like over the course of human history, empires definitely rise and fall and something always takes their place. Like whenever there's a void, something will take its place. Um, but I think being drawn to the place that is at the time, like the current empire, it's like, because yeah, 2,500 years ago, you would have been like, I'm going to travel to Athens. That's going to be the center of where I'm going to go. That's where culture is yes. emanating to the rest of the world. Yes. That's where, you know, philosophy is, is coming from. Yes. So the same way I feel about California, that's where the new wave of thinking is coming from. Yes. That's, you know, all these things, whether it's music or movies, all the stuff I'm passionate about. This is the source. Yeah. So why not be closer to the source? That makes total sense. And I think that, you know, hearing you speak of yourself as like a stupid immigrant, I was like, I don't perceive you that way at all. It seems Thank like you. <laughs> yeah. it seems like you were like, this is what I'm passionate about. This is what aligns with me. Where are people who are in alignment? Where can I find the source that's most in alignment with me? I guess stupidity is not the word. Is na- na- I'm naivete? Naive. Naivete is probably <laughs> right. Thank you. That's the word. But I don't mind being naive. Because yeah. if that means having a big dream that, hey, might realize itself, might not. Yeah. But it still fuels you to move forward. And yeah. I need that fuel. Exactly. And I think that one thing I've talked with other guests, especially, I'm so glad to be talking to people that aren't just from America. Because one of the things that my American guests have commented on is like the pragmatism of the dream here. Where especially like if you are an artist, you often have to have a day job. And a lot of people are embarrassed about that. And I feel like at least in California, everyone presupposes, like you said, with acting, there's going to be downtime. So everyone thinks like, if you're an actor, everyone thinks you have another job. Yeah. Because they're like, what else would you do? <laughs> so that's that's the opposite. The, that's the reverse stigma yeah. about following your dream. There's yeah. always going to be some kind of stigma, but I prefer that stigma of, oh, I'm following my dream and I will, and I have in the past needed to rely on something else as well. Yeah. But I would rather do that than just settle yeah. in anything else. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm fine with that stigma. 
I was going to say, like, I personally, that's why I started the podcast, is I was just like, I felt ashamed that I liked my day job. <laughs> I was like, but I like being a therapist. Yeah. I was like, yeah. does this mean I'm cheating on music? <laughs> like, right, because there's such a pressure to pick what you are. Even, like, remember that train spotting, choose life, yes. choose job, choose your identity, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you gay or straight? Mm -hmm. Are you a therapist or are you uh, a musician? Exactly. Are you so? What? Who made that up? Like, there's certain safety, I think, in having putting people in boxes and saying, "Yes, she's a therapist, not a musician. She's gay. She's not straight. So mm -hmm. I know what to do with you now. Right. I know how right. to define you. So thank God, S, uh, <laughs> that whatever you know. Yes. That that we don't have to abide by these boxes because yes. neither, I mean, I can sense that neither of us is abiding by that, by those standards. Who made that? Like, there's a lot of things I want to know, like, let's go back a minute. Who yes. made this Who made box? That? Why do I have to go in it? I wonder <laughs> that every day. Yeah. <laughs> and I like, I literally made it my job to ask people about this. Cause right. I'm like, I'm like, right. why? I fully understand when people do feel devoted to a passion. Like, cause there are some people that are monofocused. But even the people that I think of that like that spring to mind that are monofocus, like Tesla was passionate about electricity. But I thought about all the forms which that took. Yes. And I'm like, okay, so there was a broad overarching, you know, electricity. But like thinking about all the things that he created and all the things that worked and all the things that didn't. <laughs> like... Right. And at the same time, the need perhaps is not to make music. The need is not to act. But the need that connects all of these is to connect. Exactly. Uh, to feel part of something, to feel like you're contributing something, you are affecting something uh, within your reach and outside of that. Yeah. So if you think about it that way, I could do that by being a therapist, by making trap music, uh, by being in, on, on film mm -hmm. and expressing emotions. Yes. You know, but it's really, the underlying need is not the art form, it's the need to connect. It's a need to connect. Thinking about that underlying drive to connect and also... The multiple forms it takes maybe that's why sometimes people will only pick one because sometimes connecting is scary oh i think in many many cases connecting is scary right. and yet i feel it's one of our innate sort of needs purposes is to connect yeah. at some point we were all a speck that just dispersed into the universe and yes. became a bazillion things yes we all came from this one thing as cheesy as it sounds and you know i think our need is to really connect to whatever that source is yeah you know and to connect to one another because I think that I love the way you put that like whether it's through acting whether it's through music whether it's through creating a Tesla coil it's like we all do things to reach out to one another and to limit that I don't know I was thinking also about what you said about like that you allowed yourself to be bad at something and then to like get better and also to sometimes still suck and it's like Maybe people also fear being not good at other forms of connection. For sure. <laughs> I think that fear is blocking us from, like you said, relationships, uh, realizing your dreams or going for your dreams to begin with. Yeah. And it's such a shame. You know, I'm not saying I haven't been afraid. I, I try to make a point when I am afraid to remind myself, oh, at some point you're going to be so much more devastated by a question mark of Ooh, what if yeah that, for me that's my biggest yeah. scare like if i'm gonna choose fear mm -hmm. i'm gonna choose the fear of potentially failing now mm -hmm. then 20 30 40 years down the line being like well what if i did that's yeah when i started graduate school saying to my mom because she was like oh so are you gonna like pause on music and i was like no and she was like well why would you want to do them at the same time and i was like i would never forgive myself if later i didn't do my best to pursue this Exactly. I was like, I would never, I would never be able to look back and be like, oh yeah, I really, I gave this my all. Because yeah. I, I would have known that I wouldn't. Even though like I loved, I loved learning. Like I still do. Like I sometimes want to just get a PhD for fun because that's who I am. But like. <laughs> yeah. That's your idea of fun. <laughs> yeah. I wish I, I could have just captured your I face. I was just like, oh my God. Yeah. I was like, I love <laughs> research. I love reading. Like all of that. I'm like, oh, oh it's so good. Um, but I also knew that it's like, if I gave up on writing music, even temporarily or playing shows or connecting in that way, it would be like, it'd be like voluntarily amputating part of myself. Yeah. And that would not be doing right by myself. Yeah. 
And so I was like, I, you know, it's hard also to define like what success is in music and in acting. Cause I think that in both of those fields, like it's super variable. And I think that a lot of people only see musicians who are like, like Lady Gaga and they're like, oh, she's successful. Right. And other than that, right. they're like, Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> like, well, there's, there's different uh, variations to success. It's a very personal thing. Mm-hmm. There's definitely some objective boxes that yeah. one can tick. Uh, but yeah, uh, there's so many things like living through your art, mm-hmm. even if uh, not as many people as Lady Gaga uh, know you. Uh, I, I consider that to be successful because you get to sustain yourself by doing something you like. That sounds like a, like a good life to me. Oh, yeah. Um, even if you're not super famous and if you're not, you know, at that level. So yeah, there's just so many definitions about what success is to each one, each and every one of us. That's what I feel like. And like kind of defining success as like you mentioned that connection where it's like, did you make that connection? (laughs) It's like, yes, no. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Because it sounds like from you talking about it, that you've mainly been able to sustain yourself with acting and music. Yeah, I was very lucky that I did a lot of voiceovers and mm-hmm. a lot of commercials in my acting career so far. Mm-hmm. So that was basically the most financially fruitful yeah. than indie yeah. movies, which I've been a part of. And as far as music, uh, which has been my main thing the last few years, I started writing more and more for film and television. Mm. And it used to be more syncs, and now I'm actually doing scores, which wow. is the thing that has always been the big dream. Because now yeah. it kind of combines visual and music yes. all in one yes and so that's kind of how i hope to keep uh navigating that's amazing uh, my career in this yeah because yeah you mentioned you were just in austin is that so i was just in austin because i film i did premiered there mm-hmm. um and i was acting in that film it's called unpleasant and the uh big title translated from greek because mm-hmm. it's a greek production is not to be unpleasant but we need to have a serious talk <laughs> it's a very, very, very dark comedy set in the future. Oh my God. <laughs> um, and I also did the score for that, which oh, was wow. kind of like being uh, being two entities in one. That's, you know. a, that's a total why not both moment. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and it just, uh, the soundtrack just came out this month uh, mm-hmm. through Lakeshore Records, mm-hmm. which was for me a dream come true that my first score was coming out through my favorite label that is of all a- times. Like drive, stranger things, all that stuff have been obsessions of mine for so long. And now to get to be uh on those same on that same, you know, yeah world with them. That's it's so kind cool. Of, it's really, really cool. Oh my so, gosh. What was that like scoring? Did you, so you had to score scenes that you were acting in as well? Uh yes. There was a couple of scenes that I was in I was in. Uh there wasn't a it, I wasn't a major role because the women in this have each have a story with a lead Ooh. actor. Uh, but yeah, I didn't really mind. Uh, that wasn't like the biggest challenge, having to look at myself. While you were. Although I'm doing some obscene stuff. In there. <laughs> <laughs> Might I add. I'm doing some obscene stuff in there. but uh, <laughs> That's hilarious. But that wasn't the hardest part. It was just basically trying to feel the sonic landscape that, mm. that this movie lives in got it that yeah there was a japanese actress in it, a japanese theme in the whole underlying theme wow so it was kind of like uh trying to find a musical bridge between two countries plus mm-hmm. keeping my electronic uh soundscape yeah. element in there so that was more of the challenge for me wow um which became the most interesting thing about the project too yeah, it was just like, I'm cu- I'm so curious to hear it now because I'm like, what sound palette would you use for that? Yeah, I mean, um, Santor is an uh-huh. old Greek instrument uh-huh. that felt at times that kind of bridged the Greek-Japanese mm-hmm. sort of Is it a stringed vibe. instrument? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and it sounds very ancient. Right. <laughs> <laughs> very, very ancient. I like that my brain was like, like, from Santorini? Oh, yeah, you know, <laughs> no, but, uh, you know... That's a good thought. Um, but it's definitely from ancient Greece. Mm. And is it like a lyre or like what does um... it's very much like a lyra. Mm. Yeah. And it's um combining that with sort of uh 
synthesizers like Ooh. Blade Runner type, which is kind of like one of my ultimate favorite soundtracks of all time. Oh my god, the stuff that inspires me, like John Carpenter and Vangelis, mm -hmm. um, you know, Cliff Martinez, Clint Mansell, yeah, like those kind of composers that you can, you, you know, using synthetic instruments but creating emotion that is grounded, yeah, um, is sort of an art form in itself. Because synthesizers can feel outland, can feel um, for, uh, not foreign, but they feel like alien sometimes yeah. and cold. And I feel like that's why sometimes they use them for soundtracks that are supposed to sound cold and alien. Yeah. But I'm so intrigued when they're used for like warm, fuzzy yeah. emotions. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but every time I hear any sort of sine wave sound, to me, that sounds so warm and comforting. Yeah. Even though it's a, it yeah. is a synthesized sound, it's like... I love building sounds on that particular shape because it sounds so like almost like warm and human like. Right. I mean, think of like Twin Peaks, Angela Badalamenti, who's <gasps> my all time favorite. Ah! I know. <laughs> Who, I don't, maybe you know, but I got to work with him <gasps> and David Lynch on a project. I'm and like, I mean, his synthesizers. I'm having a teeny tiny meltdown. Yes. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> so Twin Peaks synthesizers. Yeah. We can get really geeky about this, oh, about please. cutting high end and uh -huh. about fuzzing it up and about. Uh -huh. So what's cold about that synthesizer? It's just for me, it brings me to tears. It's kind of like instantaneous. Oh it my hits God. a chord immediately. The theme, I mean, the theme of Twin Peaks is iconic. Yeah. And like, oh, oh my God. And all the work that he did with Julie Cruz too. So that's the track. That's one of the tracks we worked with was from Blue Velvet, Mysteries of Love. Mm -hmm. uh, so we redid the track together wow. with an orchestra um. and yeah, I mean, it was a pretty crazy experience, not only to meet, he was my hero since I can remember yeah. myself yeah. liking soundtracks, but to work with him and it was one of the most magical experiences of my life and therefore validated that dreams can come true Ta -da! in America. <laughs> For a, for a stupid immigrant. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my God. I still am processing that you worked with Angela Badalamenti. Yeah, that was... I'm still processing it, too. I think I've turned into, like, that meme of, like, the kid running by. Like, like ah! <laughs> it was a magical moment. Not, uh, I mean, not just career-wise, but just personally for yeah. me to kind of access that universe that yeah. I... Being, you know, in my parents' living room at 14, looking at these movies and being like, how do I get there? Yeah, you're like, how do I get from here to there? Yeah, I know it's very far geographically, but not just geographically. And managing to kind of get in there at some point yeah. felt, wow, this is, this is the, this was really a dream. Yeah. And especially like, because the work of Lynch is so dreamlike. Like that just connected my brain. I was just like, yeah, all of his work is deeply... Like from the deep unconscious space. Deeply intuitive. Yeah. 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 Which is such, uh, inspire, in, inspires such, um, you know, it's a very, lib it liberates you so much to kind yeah. of just, again, gut response to images and sounds. Exactly. That's I, what you get from him. I loved that that's how he ended up with the villain Bob even in Twin Peaks. Right. <laughs> right <laughs> yeah 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 didn't he see like i remember reading the story that he saw is the actor's name i think his name was frank that he was crouching by the bed and he was like oh just stay there that's like that sounds that's exactly what like what would have happened yeah. yeah yeah and that that became like the iconic villain bob in yeah. Twin peaks i'm like oh yeah that seems accurate yeah definitely. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i'm like what do i even ask now that i know that you worked with angela bottle Monty? I was like, you were cool before, and now you're ultra cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just going to say he's one of the most generous, genuine, magical, as magical as his music, people that I have ever met. And I'm wow. not just talking musicians, like actual mm -hmm. people. Yeah. And the fact that what, that was that happened about four years ago, the fact that I met him and I was just going crazy. We took a drive in his car in Central Park listening to some music. Mm -hmm. The fact that he was asking me things about myself about me. Wow. I was like, you want to know things about me? Yeah. I'm like, you are Angelo Baralamenti. I want to know everything. And I did ask anything <laughs> that I possibly could. <laughs> but that kind of speaks to the generosity of spirit. Yes. Of somebody yes. that has nothing to prove, that is genuinely interested in the other person he has next to him. Yeah. It's in his car. Yeah. And 
and just again trusted me with something that was very precious like mysteries yeah. of love was the first track he wrote with david lynch oh wow to redo that with him felt like an immense well honor and it was really scary but yeah. more exciting than scary well that sounds like what you were talking about with like almost like the ultimate connection of like something that he wrote then connected with people then that's connecting with you now that then we'll connect with more people. It's yeah. like, it's all these yeah. all these layers of connection. And the fact that he was so open to connecting with you in the car, that it wasn't about his ego, it wasn't about him. Not at all. Like, it was about your connection. Not at all, yeah. So I will never, ever forget that night, any, just knowing him. I will never get over it, in a yeah. way. I'll never not be a fan just because yeah. now I work with him, or now I met him, or now I'm still the same, even more probably, in awe. Isn't that amazing when there's people that you respect so much and then you work with them and you're like, you're actually better than I thought. Yeah, if that's even possible yeah. with somebody like that. <laughs> but it's true. It's true. That's always such a surreal feeling. You're like, wow, that's, uh, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> like... And to people that are of that same sort of uh, sensibility of the Twin Peaks universe mm-hmm. and Mulholland Drive, which is my top movie of mm-hmm. all times, mm-hmm. um, when you say those names... It's a different kind of relationship that people build to that stuff because yes. it's so guttural. Yes. Like, yeah, people love, um, I don't know, they love bands and they love movies, but there's a certain element to, like, Lynch, but Alamenti mm-hmm. fans. You connect mm-hmm. to it in a very visceral I've noticed level. that Lynch and Bjork are my litmus test of people. <laughs> like... I, I totally get it. I totally get it. We're like, not that I won't like you if you don't like... <laughs> I'll just like you a little bit more. I'll just... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like, I know that then, like, your, like, subconscious and emotional landscape might be in, like, kind in of sync. the same realm as mine. Yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally feel you. Yeah. I totally feel you on that. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, goodbye. A part of me has left this plane. <laughs> like, oh, that's so cool. Um... I guess, like, because you did make it here, like, what what would you describe as some of, like, the adversity you've encountered getting here? Well, it mostly came from, uh, I mean, my, my family was very supportive. You mean coming to America in general? Yeah, or even being where you are now, where it's like, okay, I'm acting in this film. I scored this film. I was in Central Park with Antelope Badalamente. I was like, that's incredible. I was just like, was there anything that, like, was in the way? <laughs> oh, for every success story that I'm speaking now, yeah. there's uh, ten times the failures to that are just going to kind of lurk in the darkness of non-mention. You know? <laughs> exactly. But, oh, there's been so many, uh, you know, uh, slaps in the face, mm-hmm. if you will. Um, there's been way more auditions that I didn't get than the ones mm-hmm. I got. There's been way more people that I've wanted to connect with that I eventually I didn't. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the fact that some really key people like him, for example, like others um, that I've been very fortunate to work with have happened, kind of make up for all the failures. Yeah, I'm like, it's okay that Georgia Moroder didn't work with me. I sent him a demo. Mm -hmm. Uh, It didn't work out. That's fine. You know, Angelo said yes. Yeah. Uh, You know, uh, Lakeshore is releasing my soundtrack. Yes. I had a hundred thousand slaps before that. It's all it's all fine. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so adversity, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's been some really tough times and there probably still will be tough times. I'm mm. sure there will be tough times. But when when something like that happens, you forget about You forget about all of them. You forget about yeah. all the tough times. <laughs> Cause I think especially for people listening, it's like especially people in the arts that are listening, there are always going to be times where you're like, I'm not at the top. Absolutely. <laughs> like, <laughs> Absolutely. You feel like that many, many times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's just like, it's worth it because then you you do get those those moments where you're like, no, I'm in this car in Central Park. But it's like, I like the way that you described it as like the 10,000 slaps in the face. I was like, oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty accurate. It is. And when I first moved <laughs> like, to LA and I started with the acting and the mm-hmm. auditions, I actually lost sleep. Oh. And I was like, this cannot go on like this because this is not sustainable yeah <laughs> like i was like oh they didn't call me from this and i was like wait 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 wait, wait. you gotta build a thicker skin yeah you gotta let it kind of you know brush uh over you and i did actually my skills of not giving a fuck can i say mm-hmm. that oh yeah okay <laughs> of uh n- zero fucks left to give mm-hmm. uh kind of kicked in pretty fast good and so rejection was kind of like to be expected yeah. i still expect it yeah it's gonna happen and you know what 
at, and sometimes it won't and it's going to be a shiny moment that's going to make everything worthwhile exactly so that's how i deal with rejection which is a lot yeah because throughout the years <laughs> <laughs> yeah because in like in both fields like in acting and in music you are going to face you know i mean historically especially people have written about how you face way more rejection than acceptance yeah and it's only then when people, I would say after about like a good several decades of rejection that people get acceptance. And then everyone's like, oh, of course everyone would accept you. And you're like, <laughs> eh. You haven't seen, yeah, <laughs> the pit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Welcome to the 10,000 slaps. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. They're all collected in this pit. Yes. <laughs> I'm done. Feel free to peruse. You know. <laughs> exactly. You can go through them. They're all fine. I won't. Yeah. <laughs> you can, because you cannot... You know, you cannot like uh, wallow on yeah. your sorrows or your rejections. There's a lot of them. Yeah. It's going to take too much time and energy that could be much better uh, channeled also in there. whatever's next. Exactly. Exactly. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the pit of 10,000 slaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, that's Are you so sure good. you don't want to rename your podcast? <laughs> exactly. Welcome to the pit of 10,000 slaps <laughs> for slap number one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness what um I'm curious like what advice would you give to your younger self or to other people that are pursuing either acting or music well first well it would be uh try to feel uh figure out what makes you unique mm. mm-hmm. uh stick to that okay. stick to what makes you unique is it your accent I mean I tried a lot to get rid of my accent I think it's pretty much gone at this point but looking back I'm like um, you know, you didn't necessarily need it to get rid of your accent. This is what makes you unique. There's not going to be a lot of people with this accent. A, um, like, is it your falsetto? Mm -hmm. Is it your, I don't do that, but you know, mm -hmm. embrace what makes you unique because mm -hmm. that's going to be your strength. If you kind of channel it the right way, mm -hmm. trying for me, trying to sound like, um, FKA Twigs, or Lady Gaga, it's just not going to work. Mm -hmm. It's going to, you know, it's going to look phony because I think right. people have a radar, even if they don't know it, you get a radar for somebody that's trying to look alike, sound alike, yeah. rather than being original. Exactly. And so even you know? if something, I mean, I love both of those artists, but it's like... Me too, but I couldn't be them. Yeah. It's like I would, I, oh my God. Like I just flashed to like seeing her video where she's pole dancing and it's like the most amazing thing in the world. And it's I'm like, so hot. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, I'm like, this is glorious. I would die. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> so recognizing that yeah, you will die basically. Exactly. And knowing that it's like everyone has their own, their own thing. I love that you put it that way where it's like, and yeah, people, find your uniqueness, find your strength yeah. and build on that. Yeah. Because everyone's going to have a different one. Yeah. And, and nobody can beat you at your that's, this is your own game that you're building. Nobody's going to beat you there. Nobody's going to beat that. Right. You're you're the only you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I know it kind of sounds cheesy and I, it doesn't really matter, but it's true. Yeah. Like, find what makes you unique. Well, yeah. If you're a foreigner, if you play the harp, you know, just focus on that, you know. I like what you said about your accent because I didn't perceive that you had necessarily an accent, but you have such a beautiful cadence to your voice. Thank the, you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I don't realize it, but thanks for saying that. Yeah, and it has, like, if I heard you speaking without you saying that, I wouldn't think that you had an accent, but you don't sound like a Native American speaker because of the cadence, and it's really lovely. It's very lyrical. Oh, and that's so. a nice way. So the accent is gone. It's just cadence that stayed. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so. That's really cool to know. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's really neat. <laughs> so, like, definitely, like, find your thing. Do Stick that thing. It. Yeah. What would you offer as encouragement? Don't fix your nose. Yeah. That's oh another God. thing. Don't. Yeah. I thought for a while, maybe I should fix my nose. Like, no, it's Greek. People that have fallen in love with me, that's one of the things they actually like, they that, like it's, that it's not a perfect nose. So why would anybody else, you know, that actually likes me not like it? And that's so funny because I'm like so. staring at your nose now and I was like, what? what's wrong with your nose? Well, I was like, you have a you lovely know, nose. As a, as a teenage girl, you want to yeah. look like you know, the perfect, you know, you know, there's a Barbie doll that right. I didn't play with and I, but I did see it. You know? As, a, <laughs> like, Maybe as we look can like tell that. the Jewish cartilage right here. Yeah, like, or the Greek cartilage over uh -huh, here, you know? Uh-huh, where it's like when I smile, it dips down and I always be like, no, be like a cute little like button nose and my nose so is like. So that's always a struggle. Yeah. With, especially with women, how do I fit into that yeah. model? So I'm like, don't try to fit into that model. It's no, no you know, it's unattainable. 
Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. And you can do you so much better. Exactly. Like, I'm trying to even imagine you with a different nose. And I'm like, no. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Well, I think that that is excellent advice. And thank you so much for coming on Why Not Both, sponsored by Under the Radar. It is vastly appreciated. Thank you so much for having me. Yay! It was awesome. <laughs> I think you can probably hear my sleeves moving as I'm just <laughs> We're both jumping up and down with joy. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's episode of Why Not Both, brought to you by Under the Radar. If you liked what you heard, feel free to like us and subscribe to us and rate us and all those, you know, five-star things (laughs) on your favorite podcast platform. You can also join us on social media. We are under WNB, the podcast, and that's on Instagram as well as Twitter. And we are happy that this season is brought to you by Under the Radar Magazine. Thanks so much. And I look forward to talking to you all next Wednesday.